there's one other way to think of what an orbit is that's going to be much more useful for doing calculations and stuff. And it has to do with centrifugal force. Convenient, but I taught you guys that on Tuesday, right? So, after the lesson I gave you guys on Tuesday, one of my questions would have been, well, the Earth is spinning, right? If you consider the center of the Earth to be at rest, the Earth is spinning, something at the equator, because of that spin, is moving at a thousand miles an hour, roughly, relative to the center of the Earth. A thousand miles an hour. And the radius of the Earth is really big. You'd think that would have a significant centrifugal force, right? This is a physics class. Let's figure out what that centrifugal force is. I gave you guys the equation on Tuesday that the acceleration due to the centrifugal force is equal to the radius times omega squared, where omega is your angular velocity. So we're trying to find what is the angular acceleration on us right now due to the spin of the Earth. So that means angular acceleration is going to be equal to, what's our r here? The radius of the Earth. It's the radius of the Earth. So 6.37 times 10 to the 6. And then what is our omega? What's our angular velocity? Well, there's an easier way to go about this. Like a thousand miles an hour is an approximation. Well, rads, rads per second. Yeah, but how fast does the Earth spin? It, it spins once per day, right? So that is our angular oh, velocity. One it's rotation one rotation per right. day. And you're right, we do need this in radians per second to use it as an angular velocity in this equation. So how do you get from rotations per day to how many radians are there in a rotation? Two pi, two pi radians in a rotation. So you multiply by two pi or divide by two pi? Mm -hmm. You so then you multiply, put two right? You need rotations. You, know, you need rotations on the bottom here so that rotations in the denominator cancels out with rotations in the numerator. And then two pi radians, and now you have radians per day. How do you get from radians per day to radians per second? You just need to know how many seconds there are in a day. I will provide you with that number. Are we going to be multiplying by that number or dividing by that number? Dividing. No. So it's multiplying because you're trying to cancel that. Oh, wait, no, you're dividing by the whatever. We need days to be in the numerator now so that this numerator day and this denominator day cancel. So in one day, there are 86,400 seconds. If you were to plug this in your calculator, you'd end up getting the angular velocity or in radians per second, which is, if you do that calculation, you end up getting that the acceleration due to the centrifugal force on us right now as we speak due to the spin of the Earth <laughs> is 0.0337 meters per second squared. As compared to the 9.8 meters per second squared due to gravity, that is negligible. That's why it doesn't seem like we're flying out here. If you actually figure out the ratio there, it is 1 290th. So technically, someone who weighed 290 pounds would be made one pound lighter because of the centrifugal force, but again, that's relatively negligible. But how fast would the Earth have to spin for those two? things to balance out. Make the acceleration equal my point. We can figure it out. <laughs> Alright, so we're using the same equation here, right? Now we want our acceleration to be 9.8 meters per second squared so that it cancels out with the 9.8 meter per second squared of gravity. Okay? So we plug 9.8 in here and we're trying to find what new um, angular velocity. So solve this equation for angular velocity, you end up getting 0 0.00124, but that's in radians per second. If you convert this from radians per second to rotations per day, it's, wait for it, it's 17. You guys are, remember, oh, how I yeah, told you to remember oh, that yeah. the International Space Station goes around 17 times a day? Oh, it's okay. Because its centrifugal force is balancing out with its force due to gravity. Like, another way to think of things being in orbit is that there's the, what they're experiencing due to centrifugal force 
cancels out what they're experiencing due to gravity. So this is going to make doing calculations much easier. So you pointed out that to build the space elevator, we need to do what? We need, we need the satellite to be orbiting at the exact same speed that the Earth is turning so that it stays over the same spot on Earth and we can run a tether between them and the tether doesn't get wound around the Earth, right? So um, we need to figure out how far a satellite would have to be from the Earth in order for it to um, rotate at the same thing. We can do that. It's going to be a little more complicated, but I promise you guys will definitely be able to follow along. I'll explain every step of the way. We might think that, again, we just need the acceleration due to the centrifugal force to be equal to the acceleration due to gravity, so just plug 9.8 in here, right? But we just did that. Like, that's not going to give us the right answer. What the problem there is that this thing is going to need to be so far away from Earth that the gravity will be reduced by a significant factor that we need to take into account. But we can account for that. So again, what is the acceleration due to gravity, the formula for the acceleration due to gravity? Yeah, we just did it earlier. The force due to gravity is g times m1 times m2, but the acceleration due to gravity is just g of the mass of the Earth divided by r squared. R squared. And again, we need the acceleration due to gravity to be equal to the acceleration due to the centrifugal force. So now plug these in, and you get g times me over r squared is equal to r omega squared. We know the gravitational constant, we know the mass of the Earth, radius is what we're looking for, radius is what we're looking for, and we know that, again, the angular velocity needs to be one rotation per day. We know all of these variables except for r, so we can solve for r. If you solve this equation for r, what you end up getting is r is equal to the cubed root. It's like the square root, only cubic. Cubed root of g times the mass of the earth divided by omega squared. So again, plug in the value of g, the value for the mass of the earth, and one rotation per day in radians per second. I already did this, so don't worry about it. You end up getting that r is equal to 4.22 times 10 to the 7 meters which, to put that in a little bit of context, is 42,200 kilometers. Kilometers is just a little bit shorter than a mile. Almost 40,000 miles. How long is that? Like, as compared to the diameter of the Earth. As compared to 42,200 kilometers, the diameter of the Earth is 12,700 kilometers. So this is three Point three times longer, like if you strung a cable out to this satellite, that cable would need to be 3.3 times longer than the Earth is wide. We try to draw this in scale over here. If the Earth were that big, it would be like one, two, three, the satellite would be somewhere around here. That is a long cable, right? And we're not done yet. The entire system needs to have a centrifugal force equal to its force due to gravity. Right now, only this satellite has its centrifugal force balanced by the force of gravity. Um, this entire cable here is experiencing a lot more gravity than it is centrifugal force. So basically, we need the center of mass of this whole system to be at this point. So the way you go about doing that is you need to make this, again, this is where like geostationary orbit is here actually need to have an even longer cable. So you can either make a cable that's like way longer or use a really, really big space station satellite of some sort. Actually, scientists that like legitimately are thinking about this kind of thing say rather than trying to build a satellite up there, we should just capture an asteroid and put it in geostationary orbit. Anyway. Um, How do you capture an asteroid? How does that work? So, so it's actually going to have to be a lot longer than that, and you're going to need a really big counterweight out here so that the center of mass ends up being there, 
And the actual answer, according to Randall Monroe, at least, the XKCD guy, um, and I trust him implicitly, a space elevator on Earth would have to be something like 100,000 kilometers long. 100,000 kilometers. So, this is pretty unreasonable, right? Well, it might actually not be as unreasonable as you might think. You might think that we're going to need some futuristic, unreasonably strong material to make this happen. But, we have actually synthesized a material that would be strong enough to stand up to the forces that work here. They're called carbon nanotubes. Unfortunately, at this point, the longest carbon nanotube we've been able to make is only a couple millimeters long. So, it's going to need to be a little longer than that. It is pretty unreasonable to do this on Earth. But, that clip on the Wanderers, That's where was that? Mars. That was on Mars. We're Let's try and Mars. figure out how reasonable it would be to build a space elevator on Mars.